thanks. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, just first off, thanks to Carrie for the invitation. We couldn't be more excited to have the CCU service up and running here. Obviously, um, as we've been transitioning away from the traditional kind of open heart interventions, uh, taking care of patients uh, who undergo transcatheter uh, valve and coronary interventions and the complexity of our patients here at the U, it's been a total pleasure to work with Carrie really in um, trying to hardwire a lot of the processes and orders and things. So I've been fortunate to work with her in um, you know putting CPOE in place and trying to protocolize a, a lot of things that seemed like tribal knowledge. Um, my hope today is really just to uh, go ahead and we'll make sure that the pointer works first. I might have um, I might have lost a battery connection here, but uh, not. All of us are from the University of Washington, um, even though you know we have history here. So I'll just spend some time introducing the structural heart and also complex coronary artery disease programs here at the U. Um, we'll talk about the current landscape for transcatheter valve um, and coronary therapies and emphasizing the patients that you'll see in the CCU. We'll also look at care pathways and the specifics for post-procedure care on these patients. So just to begin with an overview, you know, what um, you see here really is that uh, in the kind of shaded area of our classic Venn diagram is we've really had to bring together interventional cardiology, cardiology, cardiac imaging, cardiac surgery, and cardiac anesthesia. So the perfect example is our Tuesday clinic. You might have Burkhard Mackinson, myself, Gabriel Dea, Mark Reisman, Catherine Otto, and Wayne Levy seeing one patient to figure out what's the best sort of plan of care. I will spend quite a bit of time talking about the patient selection because for us it's not so much the sort of widget that we're using to correct a disease state or to mitigate things like stroke risk. It's really the patient that you are selecting uh, for a particular therapy and really trying to figure out if they uh, are indicated, if there's likelihood to benefit, and what their expected you know, pathway and length of stay is going to be. So I'll spend a lot of time talking about that. And the difference is, you know, the university has always gotten the patients who, you know, have like one platelet and this, you know, very rare autoimmune hemolytic, you know, anemia. But now what we're doing is we're treating patients who have common disease, right? So we've got atrial fibrillation, we've got aortic valve disease, stenosis and insufficiency, mitral regurgitation, coronary artery disease. So these are things that, you know, I mean, in any other hospital, you've seen a million times. But now, with the aging of the population, we have all of these other therapies to treat the ones who don't have an open heart surgery option or where a catheter-based intervention may be more favorable. And actually, because of the complexity of these patients, um, some of the device costs, um, one of these valves that I'll show you actually costs $32,500. So um, there are you know, a lot of considerations that Medicare and multi-professional uh, societies, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, American College of Cardiology, Heart Rhythm Society, so on and so forth, have put in place uh, national registries as well as specific Medicare mandated guidelines as to how the heart team takes care of these patients, not only on the outpatient side, but also periprocedurally and for discharge. Okay. No, that's not working for me, but the pointer is. So I bring this to your attention really because, you know, when um, TAVR, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, was originally approved by the FDA in November of 2011, nobody really projected this, which is that right now at the University of Washington, transcatheter valve therapy is 40% of all cardiac surgery cases. It's also 40% of the time that is spent in the cath lab. So that's a tremendous number. We are on uh, target this year to actually do about 250 um, transcatheter aortic valve replacements and 80 transcatheter mitral valve repairs with a mitral clip. And that's predominantly the types of patients that you'll be seeing uh, as part of the CCU. And that's even driven, you know, the types of patients that are undergoing open heart surgery. So I'll just um, point out here that you can see this sort of exponential growth because we're seeing more patients. Patients are coming in, they're self-referred, they want to be taken care of now at the university because of the sort of full cadre of options that we have to treat these common diseases and get patients treated minimally invasively. So just a bit of the landscape here. Um, I talked about TAVR being approved in 2011. Um, this is 
predominantly the patient population that you'll see on the CCU. This is the mitra clip. It's for degenerative or primary MR. We'll talk about that um, in a high-risk patient um, who would not undergo uh, open heart surgery because of those risks. So it's a transfemoral venous and transeptal approach. Uh, this is a cobalt um, chromium uh, clip that mimics the Alfieri stitch, uh, um, which opposes the A2 and P2 leaflets of the mitral valve. We'll talk about that. And then this is PTFE, which allows this device to endothelialize um, as part of the mitral valve. Then shortly thereafter, we had um, second generation uh, transcatheter aortic valve, uh, with the core valve and sapien valves that were approved. So we'll go over that very briefly because that really uh, set the stage for taking care of these patients. And you know, this was just last year. Um, it's through an 18 French sheath, so that's six millimeter vessels is what we need in the iliofemoral system. And if we don't have transfemoral access, then we default to subclavian, uh, transaortic versus transapical. This uh, widget that you see here looks a bit like a Japanese lantern, or as our uh, commercial pilot uh, told me yesterday, it looks like an auto refueling device that planes actually use to refuel without landing. Uh, it's the Watchman device. This is specifically used in the left atrial appendage. Uh, that appendage is responsible for 90% of the strokes uh, that are caused because of non-valvular atrial fibrillation. So we effectively close or occlude that appendage using uh, this device. It's made of nitinol and also a PTFE mesh on top of it. This is for patients who have um, eligibility for long-term anticoagulation and um, typically have had a uh, stroke or bleeding uh, significant risk. Okay. Uh, also through an 18 French sheath, transfemoral, subclavian, and uh, excuse me, transfemoral and a trans uh, uh, septal is actually the approach for this. And um, more recently already, so just in another year, um, the FDA approved the third generation um, Edwards Sapien 3 valve. Um, my point in showing you this is to demonstrate how quickly now, um, with excellent uh, clinical trial data, excellent registry data, the FDA is approving these devices. So here at the university, um, we're one of the only sites that has access to the multitude of these devices, and it means that you'll see a lot of patients coming to the CCU in transfer uh, to be either um, evaluated uh, on the front end or for mitral clip and so on to be taken care of in the CCU post. Yes? That 14 French, mm -hmm. is, it, is it 14 French regardless of the size of the valve? Yeah, so actually for the Medtronic um, Evolute R, it's a totally repositionable, um, retrievable uh, valve that's been FDA approved as of last month. Um, that is a true 14 French sheath. Um, the uh, Edwards E sheath actually um, ends up dilating up to about uh, 16 or 18 depending on the valve size. So that's a good question. But still, I mean, we're talking about, I mean, it's incredible because we started off, you know, with 24 French systems. So patients had to have eight millimeter arteries. Otherwise they were getting a transapical uh, TAVR or some other more invasive, you know, means to be able to replace the valve without open heart surgery. And now we're talking about the, the 14 French sheath is approved for uh, iliofemoral vessels of five millimeters, which is, almost everybody, unless there's significant peripheral arterial disease or you have somebody who's actually pretty petite. So it's, it's been just, I mean, tremendous to see really how fast these devices have iterated and to you know, have been an investigator on a number of these clinical trials. Uh, this is the Sapien 3. You heard me say that this device was FDA approved. It was FDA approved in patients who are high risk and uh, at excessive risk for um, surgery. It's still in clinical trial because what we're seeing now, it's in clinical trial for patients who are at moderate risk. So this is more like your you know, 65 year old who's got diabetes, might have a little lung disease, um, you know, might have some arthritis and is frail, so their risk is really moderate. And there have been um, with uh, um, the Sapien 3 as well as um, core valve trials now looking at um, moderate risk patients and their risks for open surgery are far greater than transcatheter aortic valve replacement because the TAVR risk has actually gone down for our two Achilles heels, stroke and leak between the old valve and new valve or paravalvular insufficiency is all about one and a half percent. Wow, it's incredible. So it's hard at this point in time, even for a moderate risk, kind of your 65 year old bread and butter kind of surgical aortic valve replacement patient, um, those patients are being looked at in this clinical trial um, for both of uh, the valves, and we should see soon 
honestly, you've got you know people like Michael Mack, um, Vino Thorani, who's going to be heading up the um, entire STS, uh, you know, Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Uh, Michael Max at Medical City Dallas and just these major, you know, proponents of um, surgical aortic valve replacement. Michael Reardon at Texas Heart, um, all saying that aortic valve replacement surgically is going to go away because the technology has gotten so good because, uh, again, our Achilles heels of stroke, um, paravalvular leak, and now, as you pointed out, Carrie, that we have these very, very small delivery systems, even vascular complications have become very low. To be fair, yeah. How does a moderate risk mm -hmm. calculate as far as an STS calculatable That's risk? perfect. I'm going to talk about oh, that okay. just to um, start off. It's 4 to 8. 4 okay. to 8 percent. And there are some, um, actually the uh, ACC has a great app right now that goes beyond the STS because it factors in what's the risk of patients undergoing valve replacement. So um, it's a uh, risk um, stratification that not only includes the STS risk score, but also includes things like porcelain aorta, um, frailty, and, and we'll discuss that a little bit too. The last thing that I would say is even though we're talking about surgical aortic valve replacement, you know, going away in this sort of standard severe aortic stenosis patient, obviously at the U we see all comers of everything, so we won't see it go away by any means. And also now that there are other programs that are coming online with um, their own, you know, TAVR centers, uh, there are actually eight now in the state, which is, it's a lot. It's a lot. So we are already starting to see, you know, this incredible influx of really, really sick patients being treated here at the U because those other sites that are smaller programs are trying to keep their volumes down. For example, we did 30 TAVRs last um, month and the median um, total program volume for the year of the 400 sites across the country is 32. And we did that many last month. So because of volumes, because of trying to be very cautious about outcomes, um, we're seeing a lot of those more highest of the highest risk type of patients. Uh, these other two um, devices that you see here, uh, the second one is the Boston uh, Lotus valve. So this is a nitinol frame. Um, it's totally uh, repositionable, retrievable. Uh, this is in clinical trial now. These self-expanding valves have a higher risk for um, pacemaker. And we'll talk about that just a, just a bit. Uh, the Claret is another um, uh, device, so if you see this, Sentinel Trial Claret, these are um, patients who are undergoing TAVR and are receiving a cardioembolic protection device. It's radial artery access. There's this little device here that actually effectively um, provides protection here to the um, uh, left uh, common carotid in through the um, radial artery um, down the um, uh, right subclavian and then here into the right uh, brachiocephalic vein or excuse me, artery, right, brachiocephalic, and then covers these two of the three great vessels. So the idea is that um, are we offering uh, more uh, um, stroke protection with this device in, uh, as an adjunct to uh, TAVR? So we're trying to answer that question now. The reason why I'm also showing these dates is because this program that you know, we have is really managing a lot of different therapies. Are we Please. in the trial? We're, I mean, I've seen the Sapien mm -hmm. 3. I think we've seen the Lotus, yep. right? So we're in all these trials. Yes, exactly. Are you guys right. using the Claret? Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. exactly. So that's a really an interesting trial because it's randomizing patients to a safety arm where they're looking at imaging, um, diffusion weighted uh, MRI, um, plus neuropsych eval or only MRI or neuropsych eval, and um, then device for each of those arms. So it's really interesting to see what will happen. And the big question is, as the stroke risk gets so low, you know, is adding another device actually increasing the risk of the procedure because the stroke is so low with these newer devices. Um, this valve that you see up here at the top is transapical mitral valve replacement. So um, Gabriel Aldea, myself, Burkhard Mackinson, and my partner Mark Reisman, um, we are, uh, one of, uh, we're investigators on one, uh, uh, as one of three sites that are offering in the United States, transcatheter mitral valve replacement is first in man. So we are starting um, this actually next month. And um, this is the first, it's just like TAVR except in the mitral position, we'll show you that just a bit. Um, I usually start sort of high level and then drill down. But 
we could not be more excited. The other two sites in the United States are Cedar Sinai and Columbia. So this is a very, very big deal for the university. We've worked really, really, you know, hard, carry all of these wonderful people who've made sure that, you know, patients on the inpatient side have great outcomes, all of us trying to make these programs very flush. Um, it's resulted in us being able to be one of three sites that will do, uh, it's a total of 15 patients, uh, first in man, in the United States and 30 globally, uh, over eight centers in uh, um, the world. So we're very, very excited for that. Um, you may not see these patients obviously in the um, immediate um, post-procedure period, but you may see them um, either uh, cards or um, may see them to follow depending on what happens with the patients. These are other trials that we're starting also this year. Um, the SALIS study is another um, transcatheter valve. It doesn't use any kind of um, metal platform at all. And um, the parachute study, Dan Fishbein and um, Nahush Mokadam are actually the principal investigators for this. Mark Reisman's the implanter. So this particular device here, uh, it looks like an umbrella, like a cocktail you know, umbrella in a tropical drink. And it's actually um, deployed into the left ventricle in a patient who has an akinetic um, ventricle. You will see these patients um, going to the CCU. Um, we are one of about 40 sites in the country that are um, doing the parachute st uh, study. And the idea is that this um, essentially excludes or partitions off that um, akinetic or dysfunctional um, apex after a large anterior, you know, apical um, wall MI and effectively uh, excluding that actually improves diastolic compliance and helps to mitigate some of the neurohormonal uh, changes in the you know renal uh, angiotensin aldosterone cascade for heart failure so improves heart failure outcomes so when we start doing um, that trial you'll see me coming around to you know work uh, um, with you guys on these patients is there a drug embedded in that no there isn't <clears throat> So in terms of LP combat, since that thing is supposed to be These patients have to be eligible for warfarin for uh, one year. Yeah. And most of, as you know, those patients are on warfarin to begin with because of the risk for thrombus in their um, akinetic um, apical aneurysm. Hmm? Is it just pressure driven, the parachute? No, there's actually little anchors in here. Is that what you mean? Oh, you mean for the, we actually don't know all of the ways that this is purported to work. The proof of concept has been evaluated and when we go over this, when we do our first implants and you see these patients, um, I'll distribute essentially like what the purported outcomes are, but we're still learning how this device actually works. It's like the VAC. Does anybody know how the VAC actually works? Kinda, we know it's a good thing, <laughs> but, but um, uh, we will end up uh, just making sure that you know the um, particular orders and all the usual things with all these trials are, are followed and um, Carrie uh, helped me sort of create the um, uh, headquarters or the sort of core order set from which all of those orders will, will come to um, pass. And the last one is this um, Amplatz or cardiac plug. It is going to be in a clinical trial against the Watchman device to um, uh, protect patients uh, against uh, thromboembolic events with atrial fibrillation. Um, you heard me say that aortic, mitral, complex coronary on the um, front end are actually threshold to threshold. There's a nurse practitioner um, and then an RN coordinator and then a team who is sort of on point and we'll make sure that you know who all of those people are because when you're caring for those folks in the CCU, if they discharge from the CCU, if you're looking at them pre-evaluation and trying to figure out oh, who's the person to you know really coordinate with for what's the right evaluation, is there a clinical trial component? Um, for example, on the aortic side, it's Carrie Ronham, and there's a particular nurse named Diana for mitral because so much in the clinical trial, it's me. Uh, so we'll make sure that you have everybody's contact information. It really takes a village, and just pointing out um, some of these you know people. Um, I'll make sure that you have their numbers because I think that's really, you know, key. Um, here in particular, uh, just the staff that will make sure, you know, that um, follow-up appointments are made, that you know what the protocols may be, um, that on the front end, if there's any particular evaluation that you know, and if it's in a particular window where it's needed, like a cath or a CTA or something, that you know who those people are. Um, and then you may see more of um, Tom Jones. He'll be spending more time with us as of January, um, effectively working more with us in the 
valve in valve space. He's the head of the cath lab at Children's um, and was a national principal investigator for the Melody valve used in uh, congenital uh, heart disease for right ventricular outflow tract stenosis. So there's, there's, I'm not trying to overwhelm you or boil the ocean with all these different devices. My point is I want you to know who to, who to talk to when there's all these you know, different therapies and that um, we're going to be you know, really emphasizing this over the next you know, 10, 20 years. So when we evaluate patients, we're just making sure that we can do it, that there's an appropriate indication for treatment, there needs to be symptoms, and then enough disease severity. Uh, unless there's enough risk, those patients are first really you know, adjudicated as to whether a surgical pathway is the right pathway versus um, is there no option for that patient. Um, should we do it? Do the benefits outweigh the risk? So what is their prognosis in general? Um, for the mitroclip patients that you'll be seeing, it's really um, more for uh, not mortality benefit as it is in TAVR, but it's more for reducing readmission, um, improving uh, or re re preventing LV remodeling, um, improving NYHA functional class, and so on and so forth. Uh, how should we do it? Some of these patients in one case study that I'll show you is actually a patient who has concomitant valve disease, so aortic stenosis and severe mitral regurgitation. So uh, we have to consider right multiple devices, multiple approaches, um, and, and that's significant also in the staging uh, of the procedure. All of our patients in general are uh, taken care of with cardiac anesthesia because we use um, transesophageal echo guidance, especially for the mitra clip, and we'll, we'll show you that. And then where and when. So on the inpatient side, when you are seeing these patients get transferred in for these evaluations, in general, we want these patients as compensated as, and as optimized as possible. Now these other centers are sending them here you know, for crash evaluation, they don't know what to do, and sometimes, and for the most part, we have to do a lot of education on the front end before we accept them because they might not have talked to the patients and their families about code status, because um, we won't do any of these procedures unless the patient is a full code. Um, we're all in, we need the patient and the family to be all in, and that's what you want too. Um, if you're going to be you know, treating some of these patients with some of these you know, very complex sort of therapies, um, we want to be able to know that on the front end before they transfer over, right? because you don't want to be trying to find a, 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 the right disposition for that patient or they could have also gotten a hospice you know, evaluation and discharge at the other hospital if that was known. So our team, all those people that were on there are really going to partner with you to make sure that the transfers that you get are really the right types of patients and that people go in eyes wide open. Okay. Um, Otherwise, in general, most of these patients get evaluated with appropriate diagnostic studies, and most of them are treated within 14 to 30 days. The biggest sort of hurdle on the inpatient side if they come in as transfers is, I mean, it's so silly, but it goes back to just, do they have any dental infections? And, you know, there's a big risk of um, endocarditis for a number of these um, devices. It's usually that um, polyester or PTFE mesh that can get uh, infected. And so uh, some of the patients that are transferring in, we have um, real concern about their, uh, their, their teeth. I mean, whether they're gonna get broken for uh, uh, be just being intubated, whether a TEE uh, guided procedure is actually feasible and safe, and whether you know, bacterial endocarditis will be an issue. And sometimes it just all goes back to the dental consult and um, patients that have dental extractions, which is more often than you would think I don't care. You want to mention <laughs> that dental extractions piece? It can be um, uh, it can be prohibitive for some patients to be treated expeditiously if there are dental concerns. So that can often be the the limiter. If they're an extremist, we can also move forward. You know, eyes wide open if it's the right thing to do and treat those patients. But otherwise, there's. On Mondays, I encourage you to come to our heart team meeting. We go over all of our complex mitral and aortic patients. Mondays in the CT surgery conference room, it's AA115 from seven to eight. So um, we have people from radiology there. Um, most of the cardiac surgeons are there. Uh, multiple interventional cardiologists, Catherine Otto's there. Um, just a, we're all there just discussing cases. What's the right thing to do? And it's always a great learning experience for us 
you know, to be able to sit there and have Catherine Otto go over an echo um, and tell you why you shouldn't treat that patient and why this is radiation heart disease related, is, it's phenomenal. So Carrie was talking earlier about the STS risk score. Um, you can see all the factors here. I don't know if you've ever calculated one before, trying to send somebody to you know, open heart surgery or trying to understand what their risk of morbidity and mortality would be before you ask for a cardiac surgery consult or any of those things. Um, this is what you get if you, this thing on the right here that shows the calculations for um, a particular patient for all of the things we are concerned about for length of stay and post-procedure complications as well as their um, risk of mortality. The STS risk score doesn't capture everything. Other patients we see that are high risk are cirrhotic patients, um, porcelain aorta, patients who'd had chest wall deformities or um, radiation for lymphoma and uh, other uh, issues, patients that are very frail. Also, that's not captured in the STS risk score. I really encourage you to get the ACC guidelines app. It's so useful um, and it's, it's free. So just these are two patients who are both 90 with the same STS risk score. And you know, just using your old eyeball test, which patient you would be more concerned about for any procedure, right? And we've got these amazing, vibrant, you know, 90-year-olds, and um, the oldest patient that we treated with a mitral clip was actually 97, and is just doing phenomenally well. Um, our oldest Taber patient was also 97 and lived to be 101. So I mean, it's it's pretty incredible to see um, how. Uh, if you're thinking on the front end, it's really going to uh, impact what you're seeing, right, um, once they're post-procedure. There's a number of metrics that we get for frailty. The reason why I just point this out is because when you get an inpatient transfer uh, coming, uh, uh, or if it's an inpatient that starts, you know, here, and we're looking at them for any of these valve therapies, our um, nurse coordinators will come up and do a frailty assessment and then also do a KCCQ because that's a Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire for quality of life and heart failure. We're really trying to understand, you know, what's the risk and what's the benefit. So um, all of their contact information, again, will be given to you. This, what, uh, this is what Carrie was talking about earlier. So we kind of look at risk as a continuum. So we have our surgical patients. And you can see this is just a little over 50% now that is low risk and moderate <coughs> risk patients for, you know, whether it's um, cabbage or valve replacement. Low risk is considered an STS risk of 4% or less in general. Surgery versus a study is 4 to 8% or moderate risk. That's what Carrie was asking about, which of those patients would uh, um, really undergo, you know, TAVR in a clinical trial for moderate risk. It's this patient. Um, our catheter-based approach is really for the patients who are high risk or excessive risk now. And what we are really trying to understand is this utility versus futility. The toughest patients, um, you know, that you'll take care of are the ones where that wasn't um, adjudicated well. And really palliative care needs to be, you know, involved any time that there is, you know, that question. And so we encourage, um, you know, all of you to really um, help us and be arbiters of decision making along with us on the front end, especially for, you know, the patients who start in the pre-procedure evaluation on your unit. I talked about this a little bit. We're really just mostly trying to work on expectations, education, clinical pathways, and discharge plans. So this likelihood to leave the hospital is really, really, really key. Um, it's going to be key for, for, I mean, all of us because that's been a big reason for us not being able to take in as many patients or care for as many patients or have, you know, patients move to the floors um, like we need them to. So who are you gonna see? You'll see um, potentially pre mitral clip patients if they're coming in from the um, inpatient side, and then CCU will get all of the post procedure mitral clip patients. Then, post, generally they've been going now to 6 Northeast. Um, right now they're going to 5 Southeast, so 6 Northeast. And um, there's sort of this evolution, I was uh, just talking about it earlier for CARDS A caring for these patients on the floor versus what's been known as an ad hoc service called CARD C. Um, CARD C will end up being a non-teaching cardiology, uh, non-teaching or non-fellow based cardiology service. 
Uh, so for patients who are trying to really have um, reductions in length of stay, protocolized you know, care pathways, many of these patients who can be you know, discharged at 8 a.m. in the morning, depending on what pharmacy is doing, um, those are the patients that generally will go to card C, and the microflip patients will be great there. Um, CCU may see patients pre-TAVR, and after all of their sort of surgical uh, considerations have been managed, then um, they may go to uh, card A or card C. Some of these patients, um, very straightforward um, patients, have gone to uh, card A after TAVR. Um, we've had that happen several times, and it's been very much on a case-by-case -case basis. So um, what we're trying to do now, as we're looking at more of these procedures being done with conscious sedation, no PA lines, no Foley, uh, in our moderate risk, you know, STS uh, of four to eight percent. There's no reason why that patient in general should need to have general anesthesia, a PA catheter, a Foley catheter. Uh, and so what we're doing is we're stratifying our TAVR patients now to see which ones would go to CCU. And that's the sort of patient that I would expect to go to you know, CCU is if uh, in this transition we're not lining these patients up and we're not generally intubating them. If they have a laryngeal mask airway or whatever is going to be, you know, the airway protection during the case, they may still need some monitoring in the, you know, CCU after, um, and we'll we'll figure that out really together. Um, we do have, as um, Carrie had also mentioned, some of these patients, um, Melody valves, they're adult congenital heart disease patients, uh, left atrial appendage closure patients, and then some of the unexpected complications from PCIs. Uh, we are taking care of a lot of patients who have very complex coronary artery disease. They may or may not have been performed with hemodynamic support. We've also seen not only for valves, but a 40% increase in complex coronary uh, interventions. So CTOs, you guys have heard about, you know, all these CTO patients. So um, Bill Lombardi um, has been with us for almost a year now, and um, he's really uh, just been a champion of complete revascularization. All of our heart failure patients or patients with mitral regurg, um, those patients all are now being really looked at for have they had complete revascularization when it's indicated and warranted. Because CTOs, for example, those patients often weren't recanalized or revascularized because people couldn't do it. Because interventional cardiologists, it was, it was too hard. You know, a bypass graft could go just around the CTO, and you wouldn't have to deal with the actual native vessel. And now we have, with the Lombardi and a number of other um, technologies, ways to open those up. They have complications that happen at the procedure. There can be um, coronary perforations, um, effusions that result, um, patients who need um, hemodynamic support. So you may see those patients as well. You guys have any questions about it? Any any of the sorts of you know patients? And right now is your um, waiting for you know the actual units to um, you know sort of be more designated based on service um, what's what's the plan are you guys going to wherever the patient is and um, well we're staying on five southeast mm -hmm. and CTICU is going over to the uh, like yeah five SA mm -hmm. and um, I mean I think that the patients who are designated to us will come to us mm -hmm. there's been talk of a pod mm -hmm. of um, transcatheter patients who are mm -hmm. lower risk coming to us, right. including TAVRs potentially in the future. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the last I know. Okay. Um, there are right now, um, since we don't have these units that we're talking about, in addition to 5 Southeast, um, right when you're coming out of 5 Southeast to 5 East, there is some overflow um, for the cardiac patients. Sometimes our MitraClip patients will end up there because our um, patients that uh, were readily extubated, delined, um, even in the lab itself. Um, might just need ICU monitoring, but they, uh, if you can't find them on five southeast, uh, sometimes they're on five east. So our typical patient here is an example of um, one of our typical patients. He's an 87-year-old pilot. He's got 10 grandkids, severe aortic stenosis, and moderately severe MR due to P2, P3 prolapse. You can see his um, comorbid conditions there, including AFib on Coumadin. He's got an EGFR of about 30 and a history of coronary disease. He had a PCI to his LAD. Um, he had just over six months, uh, really had more dyspnea fatigue, was not doing what he could do uh, six months ago. And in addition to that, he'd had uh, two 
um, admissions at a South Sound hospital and was ultimately um, transferred to UW uh, to Cards A. So his goals were, you know, the obvious, he doesn't want to be in the hospital, he wants to be independent, and he wanted to fly his Cessna again. So when we're looking at these patients with complex valve disease, um, just here on the left, this is an example of a valve that has moderate aortic stenosis. You can see that in general, the um, non-coronary cusp is the one that starts to develop calcium first. Um, and so just to um, get oriented, so this right here is the non-coronary cusp and then this is the um, right and then the left. So on the right, you can see that over time, because this is actually the same type of um, um, osteoblast and osteoclast um, ossification that happens with bone formation and calcium deposition. Um, and you can see these really just rocky chunks of calcium on these cadaveric specimens. And you can imagine that that makes those valve leaflets very rigid. So then you have a stenotic aortic valve. How do you define the non-coronary cusp? It's the one that doesn't have a coronary artery coming off of it. Oh, because okay. the left coronary, and I'll, I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Uh, it's a little harder to see on this on fos view, but when you can see on the CTA, you can actually um, determine so the left main coronary artery comes off of the left coronary cusp. The non does not have a coronary ostium coming off of it, and then the right is coming right main or right coronary artery comes off of the right coronary cusp. Is that, does that determine dominance? So if they have certain dominance? The dominance is based on where the PDA comes the off PDA. of. Yeah, so <clears throat> wherever the posterior descending artery comes off of. So yeah, so about 80% of patients are right dominant because the PDA uh, is fed from the right. That's a good question. Um, and what happens, right, with severe AS is you've got these calcium deposits, you saw the thickening of the leaflets, and so over time, you've got this obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract. So that's here, right? Left atrium, or excuse me, um, left atrium, left ventricle, the mitral valves between here. Um, this is the aortic valve. So this ventricle is generating, right, this incredible pressure, 200 over um, 25, in order to actually overcome the obstruction uh, in the left ventricular outflow tract because of aortic stenosis. So you've got increased afterload over time, especially in men, um, you'll, or excuse me, in women, you'll see um, left ventricular hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction. Men tend to then, um, after the um, uh, hypertrophy, they may also thin and dilate. So these low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis patients tend to be um, men. And then the um, left ventricular hypertrophy, really small LV cavities, the ones who are so preload sensitive, those tend to be women. Um, what do we have over time? We have decreased coronary blood flow, right? We get angina because this gets so thick that the coronaries can't actually give all of the, uh, um, um, uh, you know, flow down into the subendocardium because it's just so thick. That's why you get angina even if there's no coronary disease, right? And um, there's decreased cardiac output and heart failure. Aortic stenosis is terrible. Um, and we always quote patients that their prognosis, once they have severe aortic stenosis and they have symptoms, it is like falling off of a cliff because it progresses very slowly. And once they've got that combination of severity and symptoms, 50% have passed away at two years. It's a mechanical problem. It only has a mechanical solution. It's really hard initially for patients to understand that there isn't a, um, you know, medication or anything that's going to make that valve open up. And so even valvuloplasty, you saw how calcified those leaflets are. A valvuloplasty is not going to give you any kind of sustainable result. So valve replacement is actually the only um, option for these patients. And it's a class one indication. Once a patient meets um, these echo criteria to actually um, notice that they have symptoms and then to replace um, the valve. Some patients out there um, in the community or even here, you know, will see that in spite of their um, echo, having an aortic valve area of less than one because their mean gradient or their V max wasn't actually meeting the criteria that they were never referred for aortic valve replacement. And this is known as low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. Now the um, ACC has uh, divided up the um, patients who have severe aortic stenosis into stages. It's kind of like the heart failure stages, so I'll show you that in a minute. But um, 
the um, classic severe aortic stenosis is stage D1. That's an AVA of less than one, a mean gradient of over 40 and a Vmax of over four. Stage D2 is your low flow, low gradient patient. That's a patient who has low EF, right? Or reduced EF. If you're noticing all the new nomenclature from the ACC, it's HFREF, right? Little r, heart failure reduced EF. Um, so that patient may not meet those gradients because they don't have the right ventricular uh, um, contractility to generate the gradient. Those patients may benefit from having a dobutamine. So you may have those patients get you know dobutamines if you're evaluating them on the front end for us in the CCU. And if the patients actually um, like the women that I was talking about who tend to more uh, um, frequently have uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, what they have is no volume in their small left ventricle to generate that flow to meet those gradients. So what we look at is their stroke volume index. So if the SVI is less than 35, then that patient has paradoxical low flow, low gradient AS, and that's stage D3. So all of these patients actually are indicated for aortic valve replacement. Because of all these reasons, 40% of patients are not treated with AVR, and that's why we did the partner trial. And the um, other uh, valves trial was known as the core valve pivotal trial. And finally, in the um, last, uh, I'll make sure you get the book of articles too. I have all these PDFs, and uh, if you know what OneDrive is, you guys have access to OneDrive? It's kind of like a SharePoint, but it's by, um, email request only, and so I'll make sure that you have access to my OneDrive so that you can see all of these, this presentation, seminal articles, and so on, because I think we only have 20 minutes. And I haven't even talked about some of the MitraClip nuances. Um, so here, um, surgical AVR, like we talked about for patients with low or intermediate surgical risk, and for the first time ever, TAVR was part of the ACC AHA guidelines. It's a class one recommendation for um, patients uh, um, to be seen by a heart team. So again, there is all of this motivation for us to have a big team taking care of these patients. And um, TAVR is actually a class one recommendation as well. There were no um, randomized trials looking at outcomes uh, for aortic stenosis patients like this until TAVR. We, we didn't know how these patients did. There were registry data, but surgery was so good for so long, but you saw 40% of these patients not being treated. Finally, you know, TAVR really uh, um, became part of what is now pretty mainstream. I mean, almost 400 programs across the country. Um, I'll go ahead and just show you. Right now, in general, it's done under general anesthesia. This is just um, showing, um, this is one of our partners over at um, St. Paul in Vancouver. BC, this is John Webb. So the sheath is actually inserted. It, the, all these procedures are done with a cardiac surgeon and an interventional cardiologist. So what you see here is actually, this is one of the older, larger delivery systems just coming up um, from the uh, aortoiliac bifurcation and then up into the descending thoracic aorta. So that sheath gets inserted. This is a big sheath, one of our former sheaths. Wait, how? How big is it now? Um, this one is uh, the old 24 French sheet. That they still use for the microclip in the venous system, but right. they were using it in an arterial right, system. Right, we were using it in the artery. Yeah, <laughs> we used to, even before the surgeries, we would have to have everybody have a CT scan of their, um, which I and think they still, still think do. they do. Exactly but, right. I mean, they had to meet pretty strict criteria in order to be yeah. able to take one of these sheets. So this is just showing on TEE what it looks like when we blow up the balloon and then here on fluoroscopy what it looks like um, when we place the valve. And you're welcome to come. I mean, we do these procedures almost every day. Uh, we tend to do five, six, seven a week and then we're doing um, on average, you know, two to four microclips. So that's um, an open invitation for you to see um, how we're do actually um, doing these procedures. I didn't uh, really understand a lot about valve disease until I had some direct visualization with um, cadaveric specimens because uh, you know I know TEE and TTE, I understand um, fluoro, but really what are we doing? So we have in um, cadaveric um, perfusion models, um, these cameras that we put in uh, aortic and ventricular sides. So over here is aortic and then this is um, ventricular. So this is a very calcified um, 
uh, aortic valve in a cadaveric specimen. This is the balloon actually inflating. And this also helps understand why we have paravalvular insufficiency or a leak between the old valve and the new valve. So this is actually a balloon expandable valve, the Sapien XT and now the S3. So you can see really how that valve ends up being seated. And if there is a, um, a concern for asymmetrical or bulky calcification, there can be a jet of paravalvular insufficiency. If it is severe, that patient may have the valve then post dilated. If the patient's aortic insufficiency doesn't improve despite that, they may actually have another valve put in acutely inside that valve to really just tack that up. Um, the goal really is to leave with none. Um, it is acceptable and has had no difference in mortality if, um, if there is only mild paravalvular insufficiency. What's the, time, what's the lifespan of these valves? So we started putting these in in the global community actually um, almost 20 years ago now. And here in the United States in 2007, 2008. So because really it's the United States that has randomized clinical trial data, we have registry data from you know, the global community, but when we're looking at durability, we only have and will you know, really quote what we know in the US, which is that these valves we know will last what we have so far, eight years, right? Because um, we're looking at 2015 and these started you know, being implanted in 2007 in a clinical trial. Did they start doing them in Europe? And yeah, well about? before that, <clears throat> well before that. So um, the other issue, again, is in fact durability. And we don't know yet, right? I mean, that answer remains to be seen. But the mean age of patients that were in all of these trials was 84. So if you give that patient, you know, eight more years, and they're 93, then that was something, or 92, that was something, you know, to consider. Um, other ways that we can get there, you know, like Carrie was saying, some of these patients, especially early on, if they didn't have the vessels, um, the minimal lumen diameters, then we had to go transapically. So mini thoracotomy, um, obviously our surgeons are very comfortable with the apex, with all the LVADs and all the uh, um, patients that are being taken care of. So um, transapically, it's, it's shown on the left and then transaortic is shown on the right. I'll make sure that you have these. I'm just going to sort of skim over it real quick. But this just shows you in sort of a step by step. This will be on my OneDrive. Who does what, what's required so that you know, um, and then how the procedures are done and then where we expect them to go. These tiny little, you know, um, boxes are not to drive you crazy, but to tell you that I have these handouts that essentially show what the pathways are for all the valves. Um, Carrie had a, a laminated uh, this and put it in a binder. Um, I updated it with the new valves. Tells you what's needed for pre-procedure evaluation, um, pre-procedure orders, and also post-procedure orders, okay? So rather than, you know, be tedious and go over all of those things, I'll make sure you have the references, all right? Um, so for the mitra clip, the um, aortic valve is much more simple than the mitral valve. So especially severe calcific aortic stenosis, it's sort of like a cork in a bottle, putting a TAVR valve inside a stenotic aortic valve. But the mitral valve, because it is in continuity with the aortic valve, because it has these chordae and papillary muscles that impact left ventricular geometry, all of these complex anatomical structures make mitral valve disease so much more complex than aortic valve disease and thus treating it that much more complicated. So like we talked about, aortic stenosis has, when it's calcific, degenerative AS, a single etiology, and the pathophysiology is as we discussed. But mitral regurgitation, so this is the left atrium, correct? This is the left ventricle. The mitral valve, this is the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve, this is the anterior leaflet, the, this is the um, posterior medial um, papillary muscle, and then the um, anterolateral papillary muscle with each um, uh, uh, leaflet cords um, actually attached to each papillary muscle. So um, this, for example, is a, a valve um, that has decompensated because of fibroelastic deficiency. This um, particular valve has vegetation and calcium. Um, this is a Barlow's valve. So myxomatous valves over time with all this redundant tissue become Barlow's valve. So that valve will prolapse and that valve will have regurgitation because when it's coapting or closing, you have all of these jets that are getting back 
up through to the left um, atrium and often into the pulmonary veins because this doesn't have a clean line of coaptation across the mitral valve. So lots of etiologies. Um, the point here really is just to show you that um, all valve disease, this is this line here, increases with age, right? So almost 14% of patients that are over age 75 actually have significant valvular heart disease. And once we started doing TAVR, I'm sure that you guys can attest just from seeing the different patients you were taking care of now that it was on the landscape, you know, this is the line for aortic valve disease. It's about 4%, uh, 4 to 7% in the United States of patients over age 75 that have significant aortic valve disease. But look at mitral valve disease, right? So if we thought that we were seeing a lot of patients for TAVR, we will see, and again, this is why I bring this up to you because you will be mostly taking care of the patients with mitral valve disease and post mitra clip, you will see a lot of these patients. Right now, as I had said, we're annualized for about 80 um, cases for the um, upcoming year, but that will continue to grow because we are really the only, you heard me say, there's lots of TAVR centers, we're really the only active mitral center in the region right now. Much like aortic stenosis, um, these patients don't do well. So um, once patients go through this cascade of, you know, um, uh, pathophysiology, uh, um, pathogenesis, really increased load and stress on the LV. There's muscle damage and loss, LV um, remodeling, uh, including dysfunction and dilation. Patients um, have a one-year mortality of 57%, so almost 60%. So again, we're talking about common diseases that have terrible prognoses. The funny part about taking care of patients with mitral regurg is, I mean, when I was in the ICU, they didn't have it anymore, right? If they had a, a great mitral valve repair or if they had a mitral valve replacement. Same thing with aortic stenosis. You're hearing me talk a lot about the patient selection and the disease state. Because in mitral regurgitation, in general, the disease state doesn't go away just because you improve the valve. The LV may still be dysfunctional. Those patients think, well, I can stop my diuretic now. And you know, I don't have to be back on all my usual meds. And that's not the case. It's even not the case for many of our TAVR patients because they have diastolic dysfunction that requires some um, diuretic after the procedure. And these patients get IV fluids, you know, while they're in the hospital. So we try to really get them as um, uvolemic as possible. But my point here is I didn't know about the different mechanisms of, you know, mitral regurgitation or why that was important when I was taking care of these patients on the unit. And they certainly don't teach it to you, even if you have a great cardiology, you know, background or cardiac surgery background as an NP. So I just love valve disease and I just decided I was going to take this deep dive to really understand it. And so um, it's really right in um, systole that this mitral valve is supposed to be closed. And right now the ACC has um, defined MR in two types. Primary, which used to be known as degenerative mitral valve disease, that is a problem with a valve, okay? So prolapse, myxomatous valve, flail, because one of these quartz has actually um, torn. Um, if the, so that's the subvalvular apparatus, if the cord uh, tears, um, if there's leaflet dysfunction, things like endocarditis affecting the leaflets, um, fibroelastic deficiency where then the valve isn't uh, um, as compliant and one of the cords may tear um, and cause a flail mitral valve, all of that is primary mitral valve disease. Mitral, uh, mitral valve repair for surgeons is like, you know, the, the epitome of doing a very right, like difficult, um, incredible thing. So really, really good mitral valve surgeons. There's really only um, 200 um, centers in the United States that have enough mitral valve volume to be able to do transcatheter mitral valve interventions. It's not very many. And that's because it's hard. <laughs> that's because it's hard. Um, secondary MR is not a problem with the valve. It's a problem with the ventricle. So as the ventricle and ischemic cardiomyopathy or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy actually dilates or is dysfunctional, it actually causes tethering or strain on the cording that each leaflet is attached to. And that prevents the valve from coapting and causes mitral regurgitation. Or dysfunctional. Um, so degenerative is the old nomenclature for um, primary and functional is part of the nomenclature for secondary mitral regurg because it's functional, right? right? It's a function of right. Right, the ventricle. So that's perfect. Thanks, Todd, for clarifying that. 
So the mechanisms. Exactly. Exactly, exactly right. And so because the guidelines and the treatment uh, um, pathways have to do with the type of valve uh, dysfunction, so functional, right? Um, mm -hmm. Functional is secondary, so just trying to understand what that language is when you're looking at the echo reports and what you can expect. Um, so, you know, when you get this, this is sort of like the, the verbiage for primary MR. So the annulus can dilate or get calcified, the cords can have all of these issues that we talked about, and then the leaflets, I mean leaflet cleft, we've seen that in some of our adult congenital patients. Um, commissural uh, fusion, so even patients who have rheumatic mitral valve disease, they may have mitral stenosis, but they may also have mitral regurgitation. Um, this is just uh, two of the more common examples of um, primary mitral regurgitation, so Barlow's disease. So this starts off young, right? So you have this mixoid infiltration of the normal uh, um, leaflet tissue of the mitral valve. And this can progress and you end up with valves that really, I mean, look like this. There's just so much redundant tissue that the valve doesn't co-apt cleanly. What causes that? What causes the mixoid infiltration? It's actually something that you're born with and we born haven't been able to actually intervene on it in any particular way. So it is, it is something that people are born with. Um, what we see on echo is just all of this redundant tissue. I'll show you some of that. The leaflets are billowing. Um, and this is the most complex valve repair. Okay. Sometimes you know there's resection and all these other things that are done. Fibroelastic uh, deficiency, just more with aging. So again, this starts young. This starts when people are older. Um, the connective tissue doesn't um, get produced as uh, normally you know, as it used to when you didn't have 60 birthdays. And over time, um, you can end up with a ruptured cord or prolapsing segments just because there isn't that um, elasticity or compliance of the valve leaflets. And those types of valves are very, very favorable um, for mitral valve repair. So secondary MR, like you were saying, or functional MR, it's due to the left atrium can dilate. The um, papillary muscle can have ischemia, right? So ischemic MR, you usually see that in patients that have at least significant two vessel disease. Don't expect ischemic MR in patients that have single vessel disease. It's usually um, LAD and right or circ and right. Um, there's a great patient upstairs right now who has terrible ischemic MR, but he just underwent complete revascularization and now his um, MR is moderate. It was, you know, wicked severe beforehand. And that's without any uh, um, improvement in his LD function yet, right? Because he was just um, revascularized. So just to bring that point home, right, you have a ventricle that gets bigger. Doesn't matter if it's ischemic or non-ischemic. And, you know, some of the ventricles that we'll see and treat with this have ventricles that are eight centimeters. I mean, these, these leaflets are not even in the same zip code. <laughs> And um, I'll tell you how the mitral uh, uh, clip actually works. But secondary MR or functional MR, like Todd had said, really, it's, it's so dynamic. It's very difficult, actually, to evaluate. Because if my blood pressure is higher, right, if I didn't take all my afterload reducing agents, or if I, um, before I went and had my echo, I didn't take my um, blood pressure meds, um, I, you know, went and was on a salt binge for the last week because it was a holiday, and um, I also didn't take my directs because I didn't want to go to the bathroom on my way over to the university. So that patient is going to have terrible MR, right, when we do their echo because it is dynamic, if especially the etiology is secondary, okay. Now, again, there's other factors, not just loading conditions, but uh, 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 volume status, but also the bigger the ventricle is and the bigger the left atrium is. Sorry, I'm not gonna be on your video for a second. But it's like if I have a giant left ventricle and then I have a giant left atrium and there's the left ventricular outflow tract, not very, um. so here, for example, um, when the valve is closed, if my left atrium is this big instead of this big, right, one of the things that we look at is percent of uh, um, blood flow going back into the left atrium. So the bigger my left atrium is, the lower this is going to be, right? So if I have 40% of my forward flow going backwards into the left atrium, or I'm filling 40% of my LA with my regurgitant volume, if my left atrium is this big, it's going to be even less. So just all of these quantitative factors that make it um, 
challenging and difficult for us to s decide, right, when do you pull the trigger in the symptomatic patient to take care of their um, mitral regurgitation. And it's frustrating for patients because they'll say, well, I was moderate, you know, three months ago and now it's severe. And just to, you know, give you sort of this, this background to help, you know, normalize that for patients that, you know, it is very dynamic. Uh, this is just showing you on echo. I don't know, how comfortable are you guys with looking at echoes? What's up? Good? Okay. Okay. Um, I, I, have another, I have an echo talk that I can put on this um, OneDrive thing too, because it's actually so useful. So this is actually a TEE view. Um, this is the aortic valve here. Okay, this is a um, parasternal long axis view. Um, this is a three chamber view. So this actually is the um, posterior leaflet of the mitral valve, and this is the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, and here's the aortic valve. My cheating way, when you're looking at an echo, you don't care about the view or anything else, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is always the one that's in continuity with the aortic valve. So find the aortic valve and you'll always know where the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is, okay? because generally the jet will go in the opposite direction of the leaflet that has the pathology. So if I have, um, for example, like here, um, this is a valve that actually has bileaflet prolapse. You can see all this sort of thickening here. It looks like there might be a flail cord here um, of the anterior leaflet. So I would expect that this jet would go posteriorly like this because it looks to me like this anterior leaflet actually has the pathology. This is the um, aortic valve and this is the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. This is the left ventricle, left atrium. Okay. So these don't have color, but we'll look at some that have color. You'll see also in echo reports the Carpentier's um, pathophysiologic triad. So this is a very old uh, um, way to classify MR. Type one is normal leaflet motion. This is generally also a um, type of functional um, MR. And then type two, this is uh, where you see this is um, leaflet prolapse and this actually has a little flail segment. So this is the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve right here. This is the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. The posterior leaflet is actually named based on these little scallops that you see here or it's one, two, and three. So P1, P2, P3. And then the anterior leaflet is just named for, um, you know, the uh, descriptive purposes of the opposite of the posterior leaflet. So this is a P2 right here, prolapse and flail, because this cord right here has torn. That's type two, okay? Um, type uh, 3A, this is when there's um, reduced leaflet motion during diastole and systole. This is usually because of dysfunction of the left ventricle. So again, a secondary, this is primary, secondary, and this is also um, secondary. So reduced leaflet motion, mostly when the um, uh, um, uh, uh, cycle is during systole. So all of these different mechanisms for having uh, uh, disruption of this coaptation plane and then having regurgitant flow going back into the left atrium. Because the fellows will write all that stuff trying to make sure that they're, you know, doing all their due diligence in academia to make sure that that happens. There's no medical option for primary MR. It's much like, not exactly like, but it's also a mechanical problem with a mechanical solution, much like we talked about with aortic stenosis and TAVR. So there isn't a medication that's going to fix that valve, we can ameliorate symptoms, but we won't fix the valve. So right now, um, and I'll show you in just a moment, uh, if patients have severe mitral regurgitation, and even if they're asymptomatic, if it's very readily repairable, like they have P2 prolapse, like I showed you where that there's that little um, mid segment in the posterior leaflet that's prolapsing, that's very repairable. Um, those patients, you don't wanna wait for them to have symptoms, they should have surgery because the mortality is so high if you don't do anything. For secondary, it's medical therapy first, right? So those are the ones who Card B is managing all of their heart failure drugs, right? They may or may not have CRT to try to, you know, improve uh, and synchronize their function and um, their rhythm. And uh, surgery really is not used in many of these patients. This sort of patient ends up on that kind of continuum then of um, VAD and transplant quite often if this is a patient who may be considered for some of those advanced heart failure therapies, the secondary MR patient. Does that make sense? Okay. okay, I'm gonna just skip over here real quick to just show you. Most of these patients aren't candidates for surgery. I apologize that um, 
I don't get to go over this in greater detail. But my point here is again, just like with TAVR, there was an unmet patient population that had a lot of hospitalizations, a high cost burden for healthcare, and out of this, we started the MitraClip trial. So I was one of the investigators on this trial. Worldwide, the MitraClip has treated, or has been implanted in now over 20,000 patients. Um, again, the um, point is to reduce mitral regurgitation um, to essentially a minimum of um, two grades of reduction. So zero is none, one is mild, two is moderate, three is moderately severe, and four is severe. So MitraClip, we are treating in patients that have greater or equal to three plus MR. And we want to reduce the MR. We want to reduce their hospitalizations for heart failure and did so a 73% reduction in heart failure uh, um, hospitalizations a um, significant improvement in their heart failure class. So most of these patients went from class four to class one or two. And then also um, usually over the period of one year, you can see there isn't uh, a stoppage of that LV, you know, remodeling. And we do see patients LV shrink actually quite impressively and ejection fractions initially um, may be worse. And it's a funny thing, but it's because that ventricle wasn't receiving all of that volume, right? and wasn't actually ejecting all of that volume. So the ejection fractions tend to be worse initially in patients, they, they worry about it, we worry about it on the units, um, but over time that does improve. So um, since commercialization of the MitraClip, we uh, have treated uh, from October of 2013 to um, March of um, this year, there were 564 patients that were treated in the United States with a MitraClip, and an average age of 83, 84% um, of them had an NYHA of three to four, most of them had been hospitalized, and most of them had kind of the comorbid conditions that you would see with a median STS um, predicted risk of mortality of about 8% for repair and about 10% for replacement, so that's what you see there. If they didn't have something, you know, uh, like an STS, uh, that was felt to be uh, high or excessive risk, those patients were generally also frail, okay? Um, or they had a hostile chest where maybe they had a lima that was adherent to the sternum or close to the sternal table and some of these other um, procedure indications that you see there. Because the mitra clip is indicated for patients that have first primary mitral regurgitation, their ejection fractions were generally preserved, okay? because it's the secondary patients that will have a lower, in general, ejection fraction because of the LV dysfunction. So those secondary ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients have a, a lower ejection fraction. So in those over 500 patients, 94% um, did receive a clip. 93% um, had a reduction of um, greater or equal to two grades of MR and um, about two thirds actually were uh, at mild or less than mild, and that was statistically significant. So um, most of these patients, I'll go over adverse events, so what you'll be looking for in the unit, 8% um, uh, complications. Uh, most patients in uh, this almost uh, uh, 550 patients had a length of stay of three days, and the majority of patients really going home. So it's, it's a, a big deal. And, in general, otherwise, there are a few other complications that you'll see these patients coming up to uh, um, you with on the CCU. So, I mean, zero MIs, 4% bleeding, less than 1% of any cardiac perforation, um, and then few device-related events, and um, 66, excuse me, percent 30-day um, mortality, because a lot of these patients are pretty, pretty sick. So, just in general, and I'll make sure that you get this, because um, the European data, they're really using the clip in functional MR patients because those patients really don't have a good option. In the United States, this was indicated for primary mitral regurgitation patients who were at higher excessive risk, and that didn't make sense to anybody because really everybody was using it for functional MR, and that's what we did in the clinical trials. We treated both, but because we have this registry that we use, the um, transcatheter valve uh, therapies registry, you know, our hope is that we'll be able to see um, how our patients do with functional MR. What you see on the CCU are often these sick patients that come in in shock. 
or that come in um, extremely decompensated and they've got severe MR and CARD-B, what well, was formerly CARD-B and it will now be CCU, is asking if we can, you know, do a clip to actually be able to um, manage their volume status and give them um, an increase in forward flow so that they can try to you know, improve medication titration, um, get patients off of um, IV drips, and so on and so forth. I just want to show you one thing here so you can see actually what we're doing. And then I know you have to go somewhere else too, but I show patients this, that blue, you know, jet going backwards is the um, mitral regurgitation. So transfemoral venous, as Carrie said, it's a 24 French sheath. The delivery system is actually crossing the interatrial septum through the um, fossa ovalis. So transeptal puncture is done. This is now us in the left atrium with the guide catheter and now the mitral clip actually going to be positioned over the mitral valve. This is hard to do. That's why there aren't that many centers that are doing it because you can see on the beating heart with you know, a valve that may be prolapse, that might be flail, um, and a ventricle that might have you know, dysfunction or poor ejection fraction, we are literally maneuvering this clip over the mitral valve. And then we're going to pass through this valve based on our transesophageal echo uh, um, roadmap. It's done um, with 3D TEE. We're able to see exactly where the majority of the jets or the uh, main origin or PISA of the jet is. And then we can actually position, see simultaneously we have to grip the anterior and the posterior leaflet. And we can reposition this as many times as we need to. About 50% of the cases get two clips. 25% get one and 25% get more than two. Can you make it worse to deal with this? Um, you can make it worse if you actually go into areas. I didn't go too deep into anatomy, but um, if you look at this valve, this is the anterior leaflet. This is the posterior leaflet near the commissures, which um, are where it's kind of like the lips of where a valve comes together, the valve leaflets come together. This is rife with cordae. And if you have somebody who, you know, um, is actually, uh, actually crossing the valve and then coming up with the, um, with the uh, uh, clip up or the grippers up and tears one of the cords, you can end up making it worse. If you have leaflet perforation because the valve is calcified in an elderly patient and you've actually gripped in a big chunk of calcium and that's actually caused a leaflet perforation, you can make mitral regurgitation worse. This mimics the Alfieri stitch, which is um, a surgical repair that brings, this is A2 and P2 of the leaflets together. And the intention is to create this double orifice that you see here. In some patients, we have to be very, very mindful, always, but in some patients, especially if they already start off with a gradient of mitral stenosis or a diastolic inflow gradient across their mitral valve, we don't want to cause mitral stenosis, right, by getting rid of mitral regurgitation. So in patients who have complex valves that require more than one mitral clip, we have to be very careful to always be, you know, assessing that. Um, we don't want to trade, right, mitral um, regurgitation for acute uh, um, mitral stenosis in these patients. Can I have five more minutes and then I'll stop? Is that all right? It's really a I know. Sorry, uh, sorry, Spencer. Uh, it's gonna be tight. Like, cutting it close. Okay. It I'm gonna be the sharpest five minutes you've ever seen in your life. I promise. Okay. So these are the kind of images that we actually get um, on 3D TEE. So, um, whoops. Where's my little pointer? There we go. So you can see how I've labeled really the um, segments of the valve here. This patient has P2 prolapse. You can see this torn cord, right, coming up into the left atrium and systole. This is like I'm looking from the head down. This is what we call the surgeon's view of the mitral valve or the on foss view, looking at it head down, okay? And so just orientation is always key. This is where the aortic valve is. This is the left atrial appendage, which is anterolateral of the valve. And then this is the interatrial septum. And this, so you can see this is actually looking from the ventricle. This is where we're trying to clip the valve. So not only is the you know, heart moving <laughs> and we're trying to actually 
clip both leaflets simultaneously. We can't do it consecutively. It has to be simultaneously. We're also trying to do it in what is essentially a clear um, zone free of cords in the coaptation plane where the depth is about eight millimeters. So it's, it's pretty incredible to see this get done and to see how people do. So I'll just finish off with our patient and then all of our sort of protocols. I'll make sure that you have um, the main watch outs for these patients are just um, generally making sure that they're back on their heart failure medications, back on their anticoagulation, and if they have LV dysfunction, they may need more volume or diuretic. Sometimes they come up on some inotropes, and um, we do do these procedures um, while patients are anticoagulated, so they are okay with INRs of um, up to 2.5 when we do um, the mitral clips. So back to our patient, um, if you remember, he's an 87-year-old who's got comorbid conditions, severe aortic stenosis, and severe mitral regurgitation. He was transferred for evaluation. Um, he's a pretty uh, uh, functional guy, so we do ADLs, um, instrumental uh, activities of daily living, their grip strength, which is a marker generally of how well they would be able to protect their sternum or not with an open heart surgery. Albumin is a surrogate marker for nutrition, a five meter walk test, um, which is more predictive than ejection fraction of patient's prognosis after um, open cardiac surgery. Anything greater than um, seven seconds is frail. So you can see he's, he's a pretty robust guy. Um, he's got uh, an FEV1 of 51% predicted, which is moderate to severe um, COPD, and no carotid artery stenosis, his STS is about 10. So we did all this evaluation, and that's you know something that if he was coming in as an inpatient, we'd work with you on. His echo showed that he had a AVA of 0.6, a mean gradient of 36, and a peak velocity of four. So he has severe aortic stenosis, and at that point in time, his MR was felt to be moderate. He definitely had a myxomatous um, mitral valve. Um, he also had severe tricuspid regurgitation. These are some of the CT pictures that we get. Um, these patients have a contrast um, CTA of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Because of the scanner that we have, we can do this in patients. We almost always get it no matter what. And um, even if the EGFR is compromised, because we can do this with um, diluted uh, contrast loads of 30 cc's. Uh, that's very, very minimal. So it's rare, and actually in my you know, history, having worked up you know, hundreds of patients here, I've never seen a patient end up with um, AKI or ATN as a result of the contrast from a CTA. So we're looking at the annular size. Um, Todd, you were asking earlier. So um, here, for example, is the sinuses of Valsalva on an aortic valve. So the left main coronary artery comes off here, and then the right um, coronary artery comes here, and then the one that doesn't have a coronary artery coming off of it is the non. So it just makes me sound smart when I say it. Uh, we're looking at the heights of the coronary uh, arteries from the annulus because when we pin up those native leaflets of the aortic valve, we don't want it to close the coronary ostium, right? You don't want to do that unless the patient's already bypassed and you don't have to worry about it because it's moved. He was not. Um, his cath looked good. They didn't do a right heart cath when he came from the other place. These are the images, um, and we still do get CTAs on everybody, like Carrie was saying. So we're looking for at least um, minimum lumen diameters of six from the common femoral artery all the way up to the aortoiliac bifurcation. So based on all of this, um, we decided to first proceed with a transfemoral TAVR, and at least when he came over, our own echo showed that he had moderate MR. So we did do a TAVR on him. Most of these patients um, who do have MR um, after TAVR um, because they weren't candidates for AVR or MVR, the MR does not improve. If it's functional, it may improve one or two grades, but if it's not functional, if it's primary, it's a mechanical problem with a mechanical solution. So we will usually treat the aortic valve first because it carries, right, the worst uh, um, prognosis. And um, you can see here, even on his TEE, this is the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. See how this valve um, isn't coming together in the same plane, and you can see this little prolapse segment right there. You see that? So we did his TAVR. He ended up getting a self-expanding uh, um, valve. He already had a pacemaker, so I didn't have to worry about his new pacemaker after a core valve. And then we looked and saw, so this is what I was talking about earlier. If there's posterior leaflet pathology, then you can see this jet directed anteriorly. So if it's primary MR, usually you can you know, use that to 
even if you don't know if there's prolapse, you can tell what um, leaflet is the problem by seeing what direction the jet goes in. Usually functional MR has a very central jet. So this was all moderate, looked good after Tabber. So he was feeling great, he was golfing, but then he got cholecystitis, it was septic, and now his MR became severe. So we decided to go ahead and do a mitra clip on him. And so um, this is uh, just on QLab, what we're doing is we're getting um, multiple measurements and um, different views. This is from the ventricle, this is um, from uh, the head down, and then looking at these views to see how severe the mitral regurgitation is. Um, this is the valve actually, um, when it's supposed to be closing, you can see you've got this incredible jet just coming back into the left atrium. And then here you can actually see, whoops, it's a little bit harder to see here, but you can see that um, the posterior leaflet is actually now flail. And this is the area we do those models to be able to see exactly where the jet is, and this is how we decide where to clip the valve. Pretty cool, huh? So um, Burkhard Mackinson, um, Don Oxhorn, um, Surgeon Yelichik, and a couple other, uh, the cardiac anesthesiologists who are also attending in the CTICU, they um, do the TEs with us, but it's mostly been myself, Mark Reisman, and Burkhard Mackinson, and all of the cases all together. So we do these models to be able to see exactly where to clip. It's pretty neat. And then here, um, oops. This is us when we're doing the transeptal puncture. I'm just gonna point this out here because you can see his core valve here. Right, you can see that valve stent because that's the aortic valve and then um, you can see the interatrial septum which is just here. Okay. And so this is the mitral clip actually hovering above the mitral valve. We look at the pulmonary veins because um, if there's flow going back in the left atrium, if it's severe, it's going all the way up into the pulmonary veins. Um, we want to see all of this Doppler signal actually above here, above this line, because that means that it's not actually <laughs> going back toward the pulmonary veins. If you see it all below, then that flow is still going back to the pulmonary veins. So then when we like it, we deploy the clip, which is what we did. And then you can see that double orifice, or the sort of owl eyes appearance, and that's actually what we want, and he had a considerable reduction in his MR. Uh, this is what the groin looks like, so when you get them up on the CCU, we pre-close. There's no sheaths. This is what you see. He was extubated in an hour. He didn't want to wait for my discharge echo. He resumed <laughs> aspirin without um, bridging for his warfarin, and he left actually within 24 hours. So we looked at the clip post-procedure, and it looked fantastic at 30 days, and again, that's a four-chamber view. I'm just gonna make sure that you have just this little guide. It's a key that's specifically for mitra clip that tells you all of the orders and what we want. At 30 days, he flew his Cessna to a family reunion in Ohio. He was able to see his great grandkids that he hadn't seen yet. And now he's got problems with AFib and Coumadin. So I'm not gonna talk about Watchmen. He's perfectly fine on his Coumadin, but he has labile INRs and Watchman is indicated for patients who are eligible for long-term anticoagulation but have bleeding risk, label INRs, and um, he had a TIA in the past. So um, at some point, even though these patients are going to four south in general, it's um, really nice to be able to talk about um, left atrial appendage occlusion because you'll see more of these procedures combined because left atrial appendage closure is done when we're already across the interatrial septum. I'll just show you, for example, and then I promise I'm done, Spencer. Just let me show you just this last little bit because you'll end up seeing these patients, and they really won't go to CTICU. I, I expect that these patients won't go to CTICU because they'll uh, um, in the next like probably two to three years because they don't need to go to CTICU. They're all done percutaneously. Um, a lot of these procedures are now being combined. Um, this, for example, is a um, transcatheter um, valve being put in a failed surgical bioprosthetic valve. Uh, mitra clip for primary mitral regurgitation, and then uh, left atrial appendage occlusion for thromboembolic protection because this patient had a history of bleeding issues. And before, right, this 80-year-old with severe bioprosthetic aortic stenosis, severe MR and AFib at high risk for anticoagulation would have been an AVR, MVR, maze, and appendage amputation. And now it's done fully percutaneously and you know, we're taking care of those patients on the CTIC now, but really you'll end up seeing them in short order, really, um, 
in the CCU and then more of them even just going to the floor. So, you know, Emory's done um, over 300 cases that have gone to tele afterwards. So I really appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to chat with you. Uh, I'll make sure you get this presentation and then just uh, those